So there I was. I was in fourth grade and I had a great problem before me. I was in a house that only had one TV and there were two siblings. Oh, this could be a very grave problem. I was sitting there playing some sort of video game and my older sister, she walked in and she said, it's my turn to be on the TV. So she unplugged my video game console and I was sitting there and I was enraged. This anger overtook me. So I walked into my bedroom. I, I remember this moment very clearly and I put my hands on my head like this and I, I was just angry and my hand slipped and I hit this mirror on my dresser and this mirror shattered to pieces and I stood there and I couldn't believe it I was just looking I, could, I was shocked I was shocked at this moment and in this moment as I was reflecting on God's Word this morning I realized that I learned something very important I learned that man's self-righteous anger shatters it shatters literally and figuratively in the Bible, we hear about anger for the first time in a man named Cain. And God looks down at Cain and he says, Cain, why are you angry? Don't you know that if you choose me, that I'll look down upon you and smile? But man, no, no sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we let this, over, this anger overtake us. And rather than use our emotions, use our values, to get in tune with the word, we use them to fill our own pleasures and we walk in and we start shattering things. So I want to make, I want to ask you guys a question. Like me, I can say with probably a hundred percent confidence that everyone here in this room has experienced some sort of anger. I promise you, you have done it. Whether we have lost parents, whether we have lost children, friends, whether we've been wronged, whether we've been sued, whether we've missed our flight and had an airline steal our bag, whether we've had a, a trailer mi misbehave on the highway. This happens to us all the time. The world is ugly and we are the ones that get to choose how we are, we are going to react in every situation. The list goes on and on and on and on. This life, it's going to hit us with ripples, waves, tsunamis. Everything is going to come at us, but it's up to us. It's up to us to choose how are we are going to react and how are we going to develop a vision that shapes our values and a story to be part of that makes us angry about the right things. It's a powerful notion. I think it, it's, it's something we really have to ask ourselves. Do we even care? Do we even care? And if we do care, do we have a plan for righteous anger that brings restoration, that restores, rather than shatters? Can we channel our anger into something that when you look at ourselves, we no longer see a shattered image? I'll postulate that Again, this, the self-righteous anger, it shatters. But righteous anger, it restores. It's a simple notion. If you can say it again in your, your head. Self-righteous anger shatters, but righteous anger restores. So today, we're going to look at a story about a man who displays righteous anger. And I, I want us each to examine this story in the moments that we feel anger arising in our lives throughout the next week and, and in, the, in the times before that. Because I believe that anger is a trigger that something we value has been devalued. That's when you start to feel anger. So anger can serve as a great litmus test to determine what you really care about. And I know that we have a chance to care about the right things, to care about a proper vision, and we also have a chance to care about ourself, our own pleasures. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. And we're going to read about a story of Saul's first test 
as the anointed king of Israel. And we left off last, last time I was in Samuel in, in, the, in the end of chapter 10, but I wanted to start a tiny bit before. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. So then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellow said, How can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. Now I'm going to pause there. There's actually a section of this story that isn't in your Bibles, but it's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I think gives a lot of context to the beginning of the story. So before we read 11, chapter 11, verse 1, follow with me. Just listen to the, the beginning. This is what is in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls before chapter 11. Now Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, had been oppressing the Gadites and the Reubenites grievously, gouging out the right eye of each of them and allowing Israel no deliverer. No men of the Israelites who were across the Jordan remained whose right eye Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, had not gouged out. But 7,000 men had escaped from the Ammonites and entered into Jabesh Gilead. So there's a little preface that's found in one of the, the Dead Street Souls that gives a little preface to this story that I think is, is probably true after reading about it. That there was this king that was flaunting his power over the Israelites and he had literally started gouging out their right eyes to sort of flaunt his power over them. So let's start now in chapter 11. Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition I will make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite that may, we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the manner in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, What is wrong with the people? Why are they weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so it shall be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man, and he mustered them at Bezek. The people of Israel were 300,000, and thus men of Judah, 30,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, Thus shall ye say to the to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. When the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you, and you may do whatever seems good to you, to us whatever seems good to you. And the next day Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered, so that no, no two of them were left together. The people said to Samuel, Who is it that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to his people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingdom. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. What a story. What a story. So I, I want to, it was a long story, so I kind of want to just put this in simple, simple terms, telling a story. So the people of Israel, they had this problem. What, their, what was their problem? So 
Nahash, this king, was holding these men captive and he was gouging out their eyes and he basically was flaunting his power over them and they said, could you, could you just give us seven days to, to save us? We'll ask for a deliverer from the greater people of Israel. And Nahash said, sure. And in my mind, I think that he was just kind of toying with them. He said, they're not going to touch me. Look how much power I have. So Israel has this, this, this problem of this king. And internally, I, I guarantee you they're screaming, God, how can this be happening to us? How, how can this possibly be happening? But lo and behold, they meet. They send out these messengers and they find Saul. And Saul steps up to the plate as, first, as the, his first test of a king. And he comes up with this great plan. He says, the Spirit of God comes upon him and he comes with a plan. He says, everybody gather, everybody come to me and then we're going to go and we're going to surprise them in the morning and we're going to take them by surprise and we're going to assault them. And the Israelites, all of them came as one. Did you, see, did you see that part? They came together as one man unified under one vision. So they came from all these different parts of Israel of where they've been inhabiting and then they experienced salvation. Saul said, if you do this, I'll give you salvation by tomorrow. And if not, if they didn't follow Saul's plan, what was going to happen? The king was going to, this evil king was going to rule and he was going to gouge out all their eyes. And what happens? The Israelites, they follow this plan that, that Saul called them to action. And hence, they experience salvation and they are saved from this, this doom. Wow. I, <laughs> I don't know about you, but this is a real story. This actually happened and these eyes were actually gouged out. So I just want to emphasize that point right now. And what I think we see here is Saul gives each of us a carefully crafted plan to wield righteous anger when it's, when it's necessary. So I think you, we can break this section into four basic parts that, that Saul showed. So first, Saul cared. He cared. He cared about his people. He cared about their suffering. And when we, when we examine ourselves, it, it's no surprise that when we care about the right things, anger comes over us and we seek to act. So that's the second thing that, Paul do, that Saul does. He acts. So first he cared, then he acted. And I'm going to go into each of these components. The third thing that Saul does is he restores. His anger comes and it restores the original intent rather than shatters. We see multiple times throughout the Bible stories of men acting in unrighteous anger and it produces all sorts of trepidation. So lastly, after, God, after Saul restores his kingdom, he exalts God. So if you put those all together, so care, acted, restored, exalted, it's a nice useful acronym, CARE, C-A-R-E. So what, what's, the, what's the plan for righteous anger? It's to care. And before we care, we actually have to examine ourselves to really determine what is it that we care about. And a lot of the times I think we're in danger of not caring there, there's, there are so many things that happen around us that we say we care about, but we have to ask ourselves, do we even care? And will we follow a plan for righteous anger that restores? Amen. We, ha we have to be constantly asking ourselves this. So let's, let's dive into the first component of, Saul, of Saul's plan. So number one, he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, he cares to be one. He cares to be one. And when I, when I first opened, I, I opened with a story of anger. And I said that anger, it serves at this, as this litmus test to determine the things we care or don't care about. It has different triggers. I bet each of you has a trigger that if I figured out, if I started asking around, I could start triggering your anger. So some of you have heard me asking this question around, and I've been kind of discover like, so how do I really figure out what, what do people care about? And there's this man, he started a, a media company that he only writes r about good news. And the question he asks everyone he meets, he says, what are the things you hate? What are the things you hate? And by determining the things that people hate, he then postulates that he can determine what people actually care about. 
So if you think about it, what people hate or what angers them, if you think of, you can really get to what people care about. So that when we think about our angers, we should be examining ourselves and saying, oh, is this, is this anger actually given rise by something that's godly? And in the same way that anger is a sign that you value something, it, it shows up when something you care about has been devalued. I said, I've said this again. It's a God-given emotion. And in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Paul says this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So we know, we know from the New Testament model that there's actually a place for anger. Did you hear that? Be angry and do not sin. But furthermore, later on in, J in James chapter 1, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the, ma the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So in general, we know that there's righteous anger, that's the first kind, that comes from God, and there's self-righteous anger, or anger from man. And then I'm going to postulate even more that there's an absence of anger. I'm going to call that apathy. There's a lack of caring. And if you're showing apathy when you should be showing anger, you should also be thinking, all right, there's, there's something that's wrong here. Something, something in my, my value, something in my story that doesn't align with God's word. So I want each of you to spend just five seconds just thinking about that anger question. What is something that makes your blood boil? It can be something small, it can be something big. And if you can't think of something right off the bat, then I think we got, you should spend some more time postulating that question to you. What do I really care about? What, what sets me off? There's a, there's a famous story, some of you may have heard it, it's called Alice in Wonderland. Has anyone heard of that story? So Lewis Carroll writes a story and there's this famous scene and Alice is seeking advice from this Chesh I don't even know how to say this, Cheshire cat on where she should go next in life. So I'm just going to read you four lines. The Cheshire cat says to Alice, where are you going? And Alice looks back up at the cat and she says, which way should I go? And the cat looks down and says, that depends on where you are going. And Alice says, I don't know. And then the Cheshire cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. It, it, it's actually an interesting lesson. If we're lost, and we don't have direction in our lives, if we don't have meaning, if we don't have goals, it doesn't matter where we go. The, the Cheshire cat is so right. We need to be constantly setting goals for ourselves. If not, we're going to get lost in this abyss. And you, you hear about these men who write about the meaning of the universe, and they sit there and they get depressed, and then they, up, they end up taking their own lives. And no wonder they're not setting goals for themselves because they don't know where they're going. There's a, a man named... Viktor Frankl, he was a therapist right after World War II and he was working in a place called Vienna and working at a hospital and trying to solve this incredible problem that all of the hospital patients were dealing with suicide because they didn't, they had just come off the, after, out of the war after Holocaust. So here's this therapist saying, how can I, how can I solve this problem? And he came up with a philosophy that's known as, it's called logotherapia or logotherapy. And Viktor Frankl postulates that in order to be healthy, people need just three basic things. In order to be healthy, you need three basic things. Do meaningful work. So create a project that is meaningful to work on. Then do it with a community of friends. So create meaningful work, do it with a community of friends, then take any amount of suffering that you have experienced and find something positive about it. Be optimistic. Three things. 
So Frankel, he started going over with this with the hospital patients and all of a sudden suicide rates dropped off the map. And Frankel, he, Frankel finds, some, finds something really meaningful here. So he postulates that life is about meaning, which is in complete opposition to a man named Sigmund Freud. And he postulates that life is about pleasure. And Viktor Frankl said, no, 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 no. Life's about meaning. And when you can't find meaning, you dull yourself with pleasure. And not a single person committed suicide under his watch. And I look at this and I think, that's powerful. Can you think about this? So when you, when you have anger about something insignificant, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present a thesis that in that moment, you're about your pleasure, not about your meaning. So I'll give you an example. You're driving the city streets of Boston. Someone cuts you off. I know this has never happened. Brother Earl, it's never happened to anyone here. And all of a sudden, you get anger. You get angry. You can, you can postulate that in that moment, you're all about your own pleasure. And you've forgotten about your narrative. You've forgotten about your, your story. So without this, without this story, you're in, you're in danger. You're in danger of what Abraham Maslow is, is calls, you're in danger of falling into a narrative void like Alice, where you look up at a cat and you're asking, which way should I go? And you don't even know where you're going. So do you know, can you wake up every morning and can you say to yourself, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I'm making disciples. I am following out the Great Commission. Or do you wake up every morning and do you say to yourself, this day is about me. This day is about my pleasure and what I care about. And when you, when you get your values right, when you get what you care about right, then you get angry about the right things. So use your anger as a litmus test for what you care about. One of my, probably my favorite verses in, in this whole chapter comes in, in verse 7. And I'm just going to read it one more time. So, he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the messengers saying, whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so it shall be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people and they came out as one man. They came out as one man. So in this is a story, we, we actually learn a really positive, a positive lesson that if you as a people, if you can wake up and care about the same things, you can actually operate as a single unit, as one man, as opposed to acting as a decentralized group of individuals. Now, I think Jesus chewed on to this very early on in his ministry. He knew this. He knew the power of giving people a narrative to latch on to, to give people, what, did he, what, did he, what is the church basically designed to do? It's basically designed to give something meaningful to work on, to build the church, to build the kingdom, to, to give you a group, a community of friends to work on it with, like Victor Stankel posited. And three, whenever you encounter trials, whenever you encounter struggles, you find the positive in it. So Victor Frankl, He's essentially just saying exactly what the Bible says and just putting it in different words. I think it's beautiful. And I think it's something that we need to be incredibly attuned to. I'm going to tell a story that Harry can probably, can probably sympathize with. So I went to the Air Force Academy, as many of you know, and one of the first things that you learn in basic training is how to march. Did you, le did you learn how to march? Okay. So basically, marching is, in this day and age, I would say it's, it's, it's almost pointless. Like, I would never march in battle. You don't march in battle. But the, the military knows that if they can take a group of 25 young, disoriented, not disciplined people, and they can create, and they can teach them to, to march to the rhythm and have a battle rhythm, then they start marching as one unit. It's incredible to watch this experience where the first, the first time a group of 
of soldiers starts marching together. They're out of step. They're sort of tripping. And you give commands to turn. And everybody turns as one. And then you, you hone it into them. You spend hours and hours and hours teaching them how to turn right, how to turn left, how to come to attention, when to start, what foot to start with. And then all of a sudden, at the end of your training, you look and it's almost like every single soldier is identical, marching to the same battle rhythm. And here, we, we have the same principle. If we can get a narrative and latch onto it as a people that is driven by the, driven by the Word of God, then we can start moving as one unit. We can start moving as a discipline unit that hears the, hears the battle rhythm and knows what foot to step on, knows when to turn, hears the voice of his master. Will we develop that battle rhythm with latching on to a narrative? It's something that we're a small group of people, but the church has the power to mobilize and to latch on to something very powerful. So number one, care. Do you care enough to be one? Will you latch on to the narrative of the gospel and then bring others into it so that you're in a battle rhythm to move forward, to carry out the Great Commission, as, as Harry mentioned today in his devotional? All right, so the second principle that Saul, Saul teaches us today is he acted under a guided plan. He acted under a guided plan. A woodsman once was asked, Matthew, what would you do if you just had five minutes to chop down a tree? And he answered, I would spend the first two and a half minutes sharpening my axe, sharpening my axe. It's a great, some people attribute this quote to Abraham Lincoln, but it's actually misattributed. So we see here when we confront a situation, if we just jump into it without a plan, a dull axe, it's not going to go well for us. We're not going to be able to move forward with the results we want to achieve. So what's, what's the first thing that Saul does to, to sort of act? I'm, I'm, going to actually, I'm actually going to postulate that the first step that Paul takes for action is he finds a guide. Now some of you might not have con caught on to this, but if you realize Saul has been spending a lot of time with Samuel. He's been spending a lot of time with Samuel. And right before this chapter, Samuel, in verse, chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of kingship, and he wrote them in a book, and he laid it up before the Lord. So essentially, maybe we don't think about this, but I, I bet you that before this moment, Saul was out in the field reading that book over and over. He was, he was thinking, I'm a king now. And Samuel, this man of God, has sent me literally a game plan to, to carry out my kingship. And so the first thing that Saul has is a guide. He has Samuel and he has this plan of kingship. And when he finds the guide, he actually becomes an open vessel for the Spirit of God. I, 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 want, I want to hit on that really strongly. A lot of people ask for the Spirit to fill them, but if you're not investing the time in the Word of God or sort of the guide before you, how is it that the, that the Spirit is going to fill you if you're not open to it? You have to have an open heart. You have to be going to the guides before you. Do you have someone that is, your disciple, that is making you better? Is someone, do you look up to someone as a discipler? Do you have a Samuel? Is that Samuel pointing you to the Word of God? So find a guide. So Saul, he has this guide. Next, he, he makes a plan. So he has a guide, and then he makes a plan. What's his plan? Basically, he, he decides that he's going to organize all of the Israelites, and they're going to come together. So find a guide, make a, pl make a plan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn everyone here that Sometimes we're not going to have seven days to find a guide and make a plan when, when something hits us. It's just not, not reality. So in the moments where we're not being confronted with life's hardships, we should be training for the moments when they do come up. Like this Acts narrative that I brought up in the beginning. You know that 
you're going to have a tree to cut down. So when the moment comes, have you been training? Have you been diligent to sharpen your axe? My, my grandpa, he, he, he lived with us for about four years before he died. And all, basically all I remember about him was that he had, he had eight fingers. So it's not relevant, but he would sit there all day on this couch sharpening his knife all day long, just literally hours on end. And one time, I'll never forget that somebody in the house needed to cut something, and he said, I have a knife. And the knife, he gave us a knife, and we cut it. It was an olive. We cut it. It's the sharpest knife I've ever seen. This, this just goes to show that if we're constantly preparing, we're going to be sharp when we need to be sharp. I've told you some of this story before, but at the Air Force Academy, it's the only institution in the entire world where you train to jump out of airplanes and your first time is alone. You have no guide. And the training that they put you through to prepare for those minutes is so rigorous that you go through the training when you're not jumping and then they have an incredible success rate. They hang you in this harness and you memorize every scenario that you could possibly go through. So you jump out and you hit your hands on your side and you put your body in the right position and then you act like you're pulling your parachute and then you do all these checks to make sure that it came out right. And then I'm telling you, they put you through, they hang you in this harness on the ground in a chain, they throw water at you, they spin you, they make you really dizzy, but then they test you while you're in the middle of this. And when you jump out of the plane for the first time, your instincts kick in. It's like you know exactly what is going on and there's not even a question about how you're going to act. So recently, I've been thinking that when I've entered the kingdom, I haven't been as prepared to confront some difficult situations that I wish I would have known how to. I've been telling some brothers that in Boston, I, I've, been, I've been walking into violent situations. So two, maybe a month ago, we, a couple brothers of I were, were in a parking lot and a fight broke out right in front of us. And I feel like, Maybe, maybe it was just me, we froze. We didn't, know, we didn't really know what to do. We weren't prepared. Our instinct, it wasn't instinctual. We didn't have a plan to get angry. So we, I, I, I'll never forget it. Some of us took some step towards it, then we moved back, and then we just kind of turned and walked away. And I, I was thinking to myself afterwards, I was like, that's not good. It's not good that we haven't trained ourselves to know what should set our anger off. And then, all right, two weeks later, I, I feel like God was just like, maybe using these outside circumstances to, sharp, to maybe sharpen me or to, to try to get my thinking about this. I was walking on the street and there, were, there was a group of, of sort of hoodlums, I'll use the word hoodlums, they got in this fight literally two feet away from me and they were, throwing, they were punching each other. One guy fell on the ground, another one got kicked in the face and I just stood there, I, I froze and I stood there and I was, I was motionless and, then, and I started thinking to myself, if I'm not training myself constantly to what to do in these situations, I'm going to be completely clueless when they actually come up. And finally, a week later, I was on the subway and another fight broke out on the subway. And I'm sitting here thinking, this can't be real life. There are all these people running towards me. And I, at, at this point, I had thought about it enough. So I ran to the other side of the subway and I had this big bag of fleeces and I just stood in the middle and I was trying to put the fleeces in between the two men fighting. I probably looked like a big goofy golden retriever, but I got better. I got better. Like, it really bothered me when I saw this fight and I didn't do anything about it. It really bothered me. And even now, I think about it more. I'm training so that I can apply the ways of the king in ways that I hadn't thought about. Are we being creative? Are we training ourselves? Next time, I'm going to do even better. I'm going to basically take the man and sit him in a corner and just talk to him and ask him about his life and nobody's going to get through me. I, I'm just going to sit there like a big rock. <laughs> and, but it's these moments that matter. It's these small moments. Are we training for the kingdom? Are, we, are, we, are our instincts sharp so that when something happens that we know is bad, when our anger sort of, when we value something and it gets devalued right in front of our eyes, are we going to step in? Are we going to have a plan to act? <laughs> so finally, once we, 
once we have this plan, we find this guide, we make this plan, hard posture, that we execute with confidence. We can be extremely confident in the, the, the plan that we have and, the, and what the guide has given us because we, as Christians, have a guide with an eternal perspective. Have you ever thought about that? We can be extremely confident when we, we, we lay this out, we follow the plan of the Bible, and we give our all, we execute with confidence. So we look that, that Saul, the spirit, rushed over him, and that I would say that he had extreme amount of confidence. He knew exactly what to do because he had a guide, he had a plan, and he had confidence. Many people kind of throw this at me over and over and over. I don't know how many people. They say that Saul's righteous anger in this, in this chapter basically gives Christians a, a, a blank check to use violence today. And then they, they'll, t they'll say, okay, look at Saul, look at David, and then they'll, they'll turn to the New Testament. They'll turn to places like Matthew and Luke where Jesus clears out the temple. They'll say, look at Jesus' righteous anger. Look at him use this violence. And I want, I want to just throw, it, this is, throw in a caveat that we can execute our plan with confidence because we are under the purview of Jesus as king. And that this non-resistance position, it's actually what Jesus lived out. And he, didn't, he doesn't go against his own words, and neither should we ever be tempted to do so. And we have this great guide, so let, let's follow his plan and let's, let's tune into everything that he has to offer. And here's another caveat. Many people today are confusing acting with sort of superficial self-righteous acting. Let me, let me give you some examples. So some people, there have been a lot of events going on in the world and I'm going to give you some examples of superficial action. Number one, voting. <laughs> Brother Matthew gave a great sermon about this. He said, voting is an abdication of responsibility. So there's a huge movement in the world that when there's something wrong, we actually, our plan to act is to cast a vote in a ballot, but it doesn't restore anything. We should be looking at the outcomes for our action. Number two, broadcasting to the world how anger, angry you are without doing anything. Okay, I'll be the first to admit that I have been guilty about this where I read a story in the news and I, I kind of come before someone and I'm like, did you read about this? How angry does this make you feel? And then they kind of say, yeah, it makes you angry. But if you get angry with no, act, with no plan of action, it's not righteous anger. You, you can't put it under that category. So examine your anger and have a plan of action if you're going to boast about it, if anything. All right. So first we have Saul cared about something, and then he acted. He acted under a guide, and he, he cared enough about something to come together as one unit. So the third thing that we should examine when we're looking at righteous anger is the outcome. Does your anger produce restoration rather than shattering? It's actually a really simple, simple concept. When you get angry, is the outcome is it restorative or does it shatter? When all is said and done, when you, when you got angry and you, you had a plan and you did something, can you look back at it and you, can you say, hey, I actually restored this relationship? Or did you create more problems? When you evaluated, is your family in more tension? Is, um, are your children more angry with you? Are they misbehaving? So you have th these double-sided outcomes and righteous anger always produces restoration. So which is it going to be? Are you going to use your emotions to restore? Or are you going to use your emotions to shatter? I get to tell another story here. Okay. So, we were, I, I, many of you know that I grew up in, in Ecuador. And... I look, I look up to my dad greatly because of the, some, some of the stories that I can think about where he, he acted in this really surprising way. So we were, sitting, we were sitting at a restaurant eating and I'm still flabbergasted when I see people leave their phones out 
on sort of dinner tables or anywhere in the open because in Ecuador people would come and they'd swipe them and they'd run away. So we were sitting there eating and, and this little girl, we look over in the corner and there's this little girl that had just, she, she just took a phone and she was running away and a security guard had caught her and the security guard grabbed her by, this little girl, she must have been the age of Jerusalem, maybe smaller, and he was taking her by the hair and he was dragging her through the street. Just, and all of these people were kind of like cheering on. And we were sitting there as a family watching this in disbelief. We couldn't believe what was happening. And I was frozen. Everyone there was, fr there's this little girl screaming, she's crying. And, and my dad, he w I'll never forget this. He stood up, he didn't know what to do, but he walked up. Nobody else was approaching the situation. Everybody knew that something was off. And he, looked, he pointed to the security guard. He said, you're under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you under citizen's arrest. And everyone was, every, the whole crowd was kind of sitting here thinking like, is this possible? Can, can this American man put the security guard under arrest? And do you know what happened? The security guard let go of this little girl and he just, he stood there. He stood there like he was under arrest. And I'm thinking to myself, how, how, how is this even possible? I would have never come up with that. But, this just goes to show in every situation there's a third way that we often don't think about. We talk about it a lot, but are we applying it? So I just I want to push us all to bring us hope that there are these third ways. There are ways that we can be creative and that we can actually restore the situation with our anger rather than, can you imagine if my dad would have gone and tackled him and maybe they both would have gone to jail? Like there, There's a third way. That's what we should be fighting for. Imagine the outcome of your anger. Does it restore or does it shatter?